My name is Willie Bolin. I study influence, persuasion, and leadership in selling and sales management, and I teach people how to sell. In this podcast, we'll talk to some of the world's top sales leaders and see what we can learn from them. Welcome to the Sales Lab. Hello, everybody. This is the first part of our three-part discussion with Amy Venezia. She's the Vice President of Talent Acquisition and Development at Plastics Family Americas. This is a company that owns and manages a uh, variety of other companies in the plastics industry, layered plastics, North American plastics, a a very long list. We're going to talk about Amy's rapid rise from frontline sales to corporate leadership. Uh, all of this happened in under a decade. I actually met Amy when she was a student, not not one of my students, somebody else's student uh, at a competition I was involved with. And uh, she has just skyrocketed. So she's going to tell us how that works, how that happened, maybe how you can do it too. Hope you get something out of it. You got hired by a company whose name, in my experience, has changed many times. So I'm going to yes. let you tell me what the name is today. Plastics sure. Family? Plastics Family Americas. Plastics and Family And under America. that umbrella, there's about 25 different brand names. Okay. So I, I kind of float between. I represent all of them for our shareholders. And so kind of that group umbrella, Plastic Family Americas. Perfect. And you are uh, working out of Dallas these days. Yes, Dallas, Texas. And is that a job that you took right out of college or what, what was the, t- tell me a little bit about getting started after college sure. uh, and, and that pathway and, and all of those things. Sure. So like you mentioned in 2012, when I first met you, that was my first time dipping my toe in the sales pond. I really didn't know what I was getting into, who knew it was going to become a huge part of my career. So actually at that sales competition uh, with no faculty, just kind of a rogue student, and thank you to the chaperones provided by Florida State, um, met at the time Laird Plastics. And that was the company that I met in 2012 and started working for them in 2013. So like you mentioned, there's lots of brand names. So over the years, I've represented multiple different brands. And I did my first five years in sales. I did inside sales, outside sales. I thought um, I was going to be a really great outside sales rep right out the Mm get-go. And I learned immediately that customers can and will slam the door in your face if you don't know what you're talking about. So I went back to inside sales, figured out what I was doing went to outside sales. Um, That was in Baltimore, Maryland, because I'm a Marylander. And then now, as you mentioned, I'm in Dallas, Texas. So um, around 2017, I moved over into a recruiter role and was doing campus recruitment, mid-career hire recruitment for our corporate headquarters, which are here in Dallas. And um, the last couple of years, I have had the role of vice president of talent acquisition and development. So now my day to day, I'm overseeing uh, a recruitment team and a training team. So I have a really awesome team of eight super capable, incredible, intelligent women who I am so lucky to work with every day. And so about half my time is spent on internships, campus recruitment, mid-career recruitment, managerial recruitment. And then the other half is really on giving a really great onboarding for employees, giving really great sales training to go make a difference and make more money for themselves and their families, leadership training, training people how to be leaders. You had mentioned earlier, not every sales rep is going to be an amazing manager and that's okay, but a lot can be if you just give them the right tools. So a lot of what we do is training on being a great leader and being able to be promoted um, and succession planning career pathing is is really kind of rounds out what I'm doing day to day. So that's a busy 10 years. It is a busy 10 years. That's a lot to cram in there. I know. Now, for the last couple of years, especially um, given the average age of our baby boomers and people like that, you know, and, and it's, I think the next five or 10 years is going to be very, I'll say dynamic. Uh, and I've been encouraging my students, you know, you're coming out into the market at a pretty strange time in that there's going to be a lot of seats to fill. And mm-hmm. I predict that, you know, the idea that you go from new newbie guy running around knocking on doors and sweating and and all this to a pretty high leadership role in a pretty small amount of time like yeah. 10 years yeah you know it it might become a little bit more normal because 
at, at some point they need people to do the bigger jobs. And, and for some organizations, they have not done a great job of secession planning yeah. and they're going to wind up with a double digit percentage of their people disappearing in one year or in a five year period. Yeah. And they're going to be left going, okay, well, who, who do we got? that's really good. And I said, well, there's this person we hired three years ago. Do they know anything about this? Well, they're really good. We, and so tell yeah. us a little bit about that experience of yeah. that. I mean, cause that's a very rapid uh, rise. What, what did you start doing? How did you mm-hmm. catch the eye of the decision mm-hmm. makers? How did they know that you were the right person to move into these more senior roles? What walk us through that whole, mm-hmm. that whole sequence. Yeah. And just to touch on quickly, you're right. That's exactly what's happening to companies. We have really large amounts of retirees. And uh, while that's a great thing, because that means you have people who with tenure and with a lot of knowledge, I think that's a really huge opportunity for new folks coming into sales roles. So don't just look at your tenured employees and say, okay, I've come in to replace Amy because she's retiring in two years. I mean, take advantage of that. Listen, learn, take notes, shadow, because that is probably 30 years of experience right in front of you. And if you can harness that, if and when you are put into something probably in a shorter type pipeline than we've seen before, that's going to be really huge. So you're dead on. We're seeing that. I think a lot of companies are seeing that. Um, For myself, I would say early on, I set some personal branding, I guess you could say, goals for myself. I sat down and I wrote a list of 10 attributes that I thought described me in 2012 as a student looking to you know, dabble in sales and see where it took me. And um, then I wrote down 10 attributes of who I wanted to be. And, and, you know, in 10 years from them, what would I want people to say about me? Or what would I want my personal brand to be? And to be quite honest, it didn't match. You know, there were some things that just I needed to work on. I needed some help with. So uh, one, I would say the power of mentors. I have some pretty incredible mentors in my life who have given me some really great guidance and advice. And I've learned from their mistakes. And, and really, I just told myself in any situation, I want to be the best of the best. I want to work harder than everyone else. I'm going to show up earlier than everyone else to the office. I'm going to set my own personal goals and I'm going to reach them. I'm going to exceed them. We would have a lot of interaction and we still do with our executive teams and our sales teams. Our company is really close knit. That's always been really important to us. Very decentralized, not a whole lot of layers. So you might be two or three layers away from the CEO at any given point. And so I knew I was going to get this exposure and uh, I wanted to make the most of it. And so we would go to a, a recruitment event. You know, we'd bring young sales reps back to schools to help hire other young sales reps. And I knew that, you know, our president was going to be there and some of the executive team was going to be there. And I just made it a point that any interaction I had, I was dressed nice. I was professional. I made myself known. I, I was the kind of person that if they had an opening, they'd think, hmm, Amy could be someone who fits that. And about five years in, or actually more like four years in, I really did see the opportunity to grow what we were doing from a recruitment, an onboarding, a training, a succession planning, a leadership standpoint. We had a lot of really good things going on, but our company was growing. Um, you know, we we had one brand uh, that I used to represent, and I mentioned now I have 25 different brands. So the company grew this rapid fire over the last 10 years, massively grew, and and I wanted to see the employee development side grow with it. So I actually wrote a business plan because I thought I was the girl for the job. And so it was about 13 pages and I had a business plan for recruitment, onboarding, training, development, leadership programs. And uh, I presented it to our president and CEO at the time, who's actually been on your podcast in the past. And um, I think I recall him immediately saying no. (laughs) And I said, read it on the plane ride home, you know, and uh, we're very decentralized. It felt kind of like a centralized program. And so uh, understandably, his initial reaction was uh, probably not a fit. And by the time he had had flown home, 
I remember him calling me and um, my maiden name's Kavanagh. And he went, Ms. Kavanagh, you know, I think we really have to act on this. I think we should do this. So I moved down to Dallas. I took the role at that time as a director. I was 27 years old and I was a department of one and uh, just kind of started working from the ground up and grew on some of the basis that we had already and just expanded on it. So I think two things, you've got to have a company who's willing to promote you and a company who's worth your ideas. If you have really great ideas, you know, you want to be paired with a really good company who's going to honor those mm-hmm. and um, have a plan, lay it out. Don't be afraid to say what you think. Don't be afraid of rejection. I did actually expect to be told no. This was pretty new for us. Um, this was going to be pretty different than what we'd have had in the past. And and just be willing to be the person for the job. I think a lot of people look at leaders and they say, oh, they have it all figured out. They're so great. I think people are just always figuring it out as they go. You know, I was kind of figuring out as I went, but I had some really great people giving me some really great advice and a company who was willing to empower someone really excited to make a difference. So I I credit my company, honestly, as much as I might credit any ideas or initiatives that I had, because they let me do it. I think a lot of companies might be afraid to let you try out new ideas. What happens if it fails? It fails. You do something else. And what happens when it's great now it is what it is, and I'm really proud of of what it's become. Yeah, that's great to hear, and I, I you know, I love to hear you say, you know, expect I, you expected to be told no. I, I sometimes get in outright arguments with some students over this idea. I tell them, look, the, you need to resolve yourself that the most likely outcome of anything you try that's new, going on a sales call, asking for a promotion, you know, starting a company, good, good lord, yeah, it's it's probably not going to work. And that's okay. You say, well, I think you know. I think that's a, a a negative way of looking at it. So no, I I think I think you're looking at it wrong. Then it's the reality. It's it's the same reason in the sales call that we have. You know yeah. what we call the hierarchy of uh, objectives. You know, I bet they're going to say no to a full rollout of my program to, to their yeah. entire global organization. And my backup is to ask for a trial on a specific yes. region of one country. You know. Yes. You know, by analogy, you know, it's a boxer that only trains to punch and doesn't train to dodge or or move forward when when they get punched. And so that's that's interesting. And and but you still made the plan. I mean, there's a, that's the, the the story you just told demonstrates an awful lot of proactivity, an awful lot of sort of uh, I'm gonna, you know, I mean, you even mentioned dressing for the job you want, right? Yeah, or, uh, sure. I'm gonna put on, I'm going to give them every reason that they can say yes. Yes. And, I knew uh, there were a lot of reasons for them to say no. Well, and and, and, and I had to stack are it. very good but, at finding those reasons. You don't yeah. even have to tell them those reasons. So you need, <laughs> you need to really highlight those other reasons. So here are all the yeses. I look the part. I act the part. I'm up at the right time of the day. Yeah. I'm in the office. And um, you know, I, I did something similar in grad school where um, it quickly became apparent to me that there were some very smart people in the room. And in order to be competitive, I needed to, you know, just do anything I could. And one of the things I could do was show up before anybody else, before the admins, before anybody. Yeah. I'd make the first pot of coffee, uh, uh, first pot of coffee with my buddy Bill. Uh, <laughs> we would both show up at the same time. We'd make the first pot of coffee, so everybody coming in would smell that the hallway was uh, full of the aroma of coffee, yes. and somebody must have made it. Who was it? Oh, it was Willie and Bill. Smart. And we would stick around until you know, the last or almost the last person left. And so, you know, they, if they, if they kick us out, well, I'll speak for myself, not for Bill, but if they kick me out, it's going to be because I am flat out not smart enough to do this. It's not going to be because I gave them any excuse in terms of my effort. Uh, And uh, you know, that was probably a little paranoid, but it worked. It was good. I think there's Um, so much that you can control. There's so much in the uncontrollables but control what you can. I remember pulling up for my first interview, which it would not have mattered, but I didn't know. I was interviewing with all sorts of companies and I, I was driving a really awful, uh, can I say crappy car? I mean, it was, a, it was a load of junk by the time that was barely making it into the parking lot. And I parked it around the corner because here I am, I'm dressed really nice and I'm committed to having a professional experience and for them to seeing some sort of executive presence in me, some sort of potential. So I'm t- you know, tucking my car around. And obviously that didn't matter, but some companies it did matter for. So I think you just think, what can you control? And having a personal brand so that when an opportunity arises, you're the one they think of, you, know, you can only tee yourself up in the best way possible by doing that. 
And so when you're talking about a personal brand, you're talking about even just within your organization. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a great lesson. I think, you know, younger people tend to, I think, have an easier time imagining the role of personal branding when it comes to getting a job, right? Okay. I need to make sure that my resume communicates that I'm the Eagle Scout go getter. So I'm going to highlight these things, man. Uh, or I'm the, I'm the person that, you know, learned a lot about competing from my sports experience. And, you know, we, we build these narratives into our resumes and into the way we answer questions. And then I, I don't know that they're thinking about it quite as much when they get hired. Oh, that's when it matters. I'm going to so do my much. job. They want me here from eight to five. Or I'll do that. And, yeah. uh, but there's, there's strategy to be held, uh, the strategy to be executed even within the company. Yes. Very so much. You, you said, you mentioned mentorship and how important yeah. that was. So, so hmm. give us some details on that. What, were some of the big lessons that you got from your mentors? The ones that stand out to me the most, there's so many, and I think have as many mentors as you can, is my current boss, our president and CEO, Jason Askew. When I first took over the role in a director role, and I was a, a team of one, I was managing myself. I used to joke, I'm a director of myself, you know. Um, but it really was the first time in a leadership role, and and we had plans to hire. And I didn't really know what I was getting into. And it was a lot. It was, I don't know if I'd say overwhelming, but it was a lot more than I think I anticipated. And I was so excited about it. And you start going to these events and and this is good for any salespeople too. You're going to have your sales kick off in Vegas. You're going to have a president's club trip in Cabo. If you're in the world of sales or leadership, you're going to be at these events where there's late nights and and there might be some alcohol involved and you know there's all this fun to be had. And my boss told me from the start, he said, when you're in a position of high pressure, people often turn to one of maybe three things religion, uh, fitness, or alcohol. And he said, I don't care what you do. Just do not <laughs> become the partier. You know, don't let that be your image. And I think that goes back to just kind of my personal brand. You know, he always would say, you know, don't be the first at the bar and don't be the last at the bar, you know, just, just kind of stay under the radar. And I think just thinking about that, um, I did, I could see the stress, I could see the pressure and I could see others around me too. You know, there's a lot of pressure in some of these roles and it really inspired me. I've, I've done over 12 half marathons. I've done a couple full marathons. I've got another one this year in Dallas. I think really kind of inspired me to turn to fitness, something really, really healthy, somewhere to channel my stress. And so that's something I would pass on to almost anyone. Um, but I think really what he's taught me as a leader is how to be humble, how to, when things go wrong, you take ownership of that. And when things go really well to give your team the credit, it's something that I've always really admired. And, and I would love to be just an ounce uh, of that in my managerial role. Um, there were a few others that have just taught me some great things. Um, someone else had said, you're always on display and everything counts. And there's been so many times when I've been in the airport and I've run into people I didn't know I was going to run into. And I could have been in my scrubs. I could have been in my sweatpants. And I wasn't because, again, that personal branding, that always dressing for the job you want, being at the right place at the right time. It's all about who you know. You put those things together and magic can happen. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. You can let your guard down. You can relax. But, you know, always be presentable. Always be ready to have a conversation. I've run into customers. I have run into executives. I've run into sales teams in route to competitions and just thinking, okay, at any point, could I have a professional interaction with someone right here, right now? And yeah. do I feel prepared for that? I think that's a really good, several really good points. And, you know, the, the idea of the way you dress now, uh, I've already joked about how I'm dressed. I've been building furniture. Okay. You're at home. Fantastic. Right? <laughs> Nobody, no, no, perspective, uh, you know, business partner should be wandering through my home today, I think. But, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a habit, right? It's, um, you know, and, and this is uh, easy for some people and hard for some people, you know, hard for others. It's, uh, okay, I, I need to be up. I need to, my hair needs to be done. Well, why? What are you doing? Well, n maybe nothing. Yeah. But my habits tell me that I'm going to do these things and it becomes perfectly routine. And then, you know, when these, uh, you know, it's like our, uh, you know, the, the uh, 
now past uh, director of the FSU Sales Institute mm-hmm. for a very long time, Pat Palantino, his mm-hmm. his mantra with all the students was, uh, you know, success happens when preparation meets opportunity. And, you know, if, mm-hmm. if you're not prepared when the opportunity comes, if you're sitting around in your sweatpants and your yeah. uh, flip flops and, and a yeah. beer in your hand, uh, you might just miss that opportunity. You might say, yes. oh, why, why does everybody else get, get these great opportunities and they're so lucky? And well, you know, form the habit that you're going to be ready on the spot. You know, if, if something surprising yeah. happens, turns out, uh, you, there's like, nothing should really surprise us <laughs> because <laughs> surprises uh, are just completely, yeah. uh, ubiquitous. They're, they're always happening. So, you know, be, maybe be ready. And here's another one on that note, just another little tagline. I, you know, I almost have a list of these little, just kind of one-liners people have told me and it is, okay, maybe you are surprised. Maybe something does catch you off guard. And the, the idea of responding versus reacting. Mm. And there's been so many times in my life where someone has, you know, maybe a customer caught me off guard with something a, a bit aggressive or, you know, an objection that I wasn't prepared for. And that happens in life where you run into someone when you are looking a bit disheveled or whatever that could be to just take a minute and respond. Now as a manager, you know, I've, I have times when sometimes my team will come to me and they'll, they'll they surprise me, you know, it can happen. And wow, I was not expecting that question today or that request today. But instead of just reacting and word vomit and and emotion. It's just to think about it and then to respond. And it's okay if that response is, let me think about this. This deserves adequate time. I owe you that and I respect you and I respect this request that we've talked about. Can I have two hours to think this through and then get back to you? So there's nothing wrong with kind of, you know, taking the balcony and stepping away, but, you know, prepare for everything, be ready for anything. You're always on display anything could happen. And if you are caught off guard, because look, we're human, just take a breath and think about how am I going to respond and make sure that it's not this emotional reaction. Absolutely. You know, I, I got in the habit several years ago of trying to not, and this is a very, I mean, trivial example of this, but uh, you know, when people just say, Hey, Hey, how you doing? I would try to give them something other than the automatic reaction. Right. And say, well, you know, but, but it, it, so now when people ask me this, I have the habit of having a pause, sometimes a long pause while I think, well, how am I doing? How are things? So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and sometimes it's more than they want to hear, but, it, it, you know, just trying to prevent myself from these automatic behavioral patterns because we all do them. And, and sometimes they're completely functional and sometimes they're, they're really not, you know, sometimes yeah. it's, uh, you know, well, why'd you say yes to that salesperson who doesn't have anything that is important to you right now? Yeah. Well, because they, you know, they they phrased it in such a way that it was really easy for my automatic response to say yes, and now here I am, you know, spending time doing something I didn't want to do, or whatever, you know, or you know, something that you treat frivolously that you should have treated with great care and strategy, and you know, it's good. It's good to put a pause before those that auto auto auto. There's a word that I probably wow. I'm going to make it up. Automaticity. I don't know. <laughs> before that automatic that behavior right. takes over and, and puts yeah. you in a place that you didn't want to be in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Any other lessons from mentors? I think just, uh, you know, asking for what you deserve and being shocked at how much people will give that to you. And you just have to ask, and that can be customers, you know, asking for the clothes. I, I train salespeople and no one ever closes. We do these role plays and going, I, you, I had me 10 minutes ago, you know, can you just go ahead and close? But, you know, if, if you're looking for a promotion, if you're looking for responsibility, if you're looking for a raise, as long as you have a really good detailed explanation of why you were the person and you have a proven track record that that personal brand comes in, you know, you can't just walk in out of nowhere and ask for something and get it. But you do these things and then go ask. And I think that's not in everyone's nature. I think maybe for women, too, we tend to not ask. We receive with a lot of gratitude. I think that's important. But maybe that's where we stop. And just to go, well, what about this? And and do you see value in what I bring from this aspect? And I, and that was something that some of the female mentors in my life have given me where I've been really excited about opportunities and jobs. And they're going, that's fantastic. And did you even consider this or talking about this? And, um, you know, when I started off in, in Baltimore, we were, uh, I, I would call it 
kind of a struggling location. And I knew that going in, our company generates local profit sharing, which is incredible. It's uncapped. It's 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 a really lucrative uh, pay structure. But you know, some of our locations might might be on the flip. And at the time, I was going into more or less a flip. And I knew that going in, I was excited by that. I actually was really attracted to that because I thought it would help me stand out. You know, you go into a really well-performing profit center, you can make a lot of money, but you don't get as much recognition. So again, this is all kind of a part of my path. I knew I wanted to be a leader. How do I set myself up? Um, But even just thinking of my mentor at the time had said, why don't you just verbalize that? And so I verbalized, if I am really successful here, will you give me opportunities to move up in this company? And can we just have the understanding that you're watching my progress personally? And I remember my first big sale, you know, sales reps, multi-million dollar sales. My first big one, I was so proud. It was about six months in and it was, I think, $75,000. I couldn't believe it. I was so thrilled. And my president and CEO, again, I told you we're kind of a, a you know, a, a low layer company, sent me an email and said, I'm on a plane right now and I'm looking at a $75,000 purchase order and I'm just so proud, you know, and that was with a partner that mattered to the company. So I don't think, oh, it's possible, but I, I do think that because I verbalized that, they said, sure, yeah, I'll watch your progress. I'll think of you when opportunity comes up. And it just took saying that. And they might have thought of me anyways. But just learning to verbalize what you want and need, I think, again, especially as a, a woman, that might not come so naturally. It doesn't come naturally to me. And so that advice, I think, really did help propel my career. Well, and there's a strange balance to be struck, I think, where you say, you know, there's a lot of value in being adaptable and, and going with the flow and pivoting in, you know, when the situation changes, you change. And I mean, I mean this is kind of like the yeah. the... the first thing we try to get through a, a, a young sales trainee's head, you know, it's not about you. It's about the customer, you know, uh, yeah. take your ego out of it, find out what they need, what they want, find out if you can meet them, uh, you know, in a way that provides value. And, and um, but at the same time, you have, you have a say, you have, you know, you can make requests, you can dig your heels yeah. in on certain things. So it, it, it is a weird world to try to do both, you know, be, yeah. be adaptive, be accommodating, be, serve others. Oh, and then also make sure that you're not getting pushed to the side. Yeah. So, like, you know, okay. Serving with strength. I don't know. I, it, they seem very, you know, it seems very it's, much a paradox. How do you do both? I think you have to be worthy of someone else adapting to you. And I think that First, you adapt to others. You know, you're considerate. You're a hard worker. You're here. You know, whatever pitch for your next job or whatever you're looking for, even in an interview. What do you bring to the company? You know, really posing that. Of uh, these are my skill sets, and I cannot wait to apply that to company X, Y, and Z. So, really showing my willingness to help the company be successful. I don't. And just speaking myself, when I look at candidates, that's what I want to see. In addition to some other things, but. I might not go out on a limb for someone that I think is only there for themselves. So there almost has to, you're right, there's this balance. And I think as a candidate, you almost have to play that a little bit first and say, I am genuinely willing to apply this. I want the company to succeed. I have this great idea. I think it's going to make the company better. And in the meantime, how wonderful that I get to be the person to execute that vision. And in doing so, I'm meeting my personal goals and and I'm defining success, success the way I always saw it. But it can't be one way. It can't be all about the company and you lose the individual. And it can't be all about the individual because they'll just go bounce somewhere else and take your ideas there. And so the company's not going to invest. So you have to be able to communicate that it's not about you. Even when people go in to ask for raises, there's nothing that drives me crazy when someone comes to ask for a raise. It's because they need it, you know, for X, Y, and Z. I need it. And, and they might, you know, but we do pay well. So I want to know why you earned it. I'm not against giving you a raise. In fact, I, if you work for a good company, they should have a raise ready for you on an annual basis. But, you know, if someone comes to you off cycle and asks for it, it's not a need based. It's here's what I've done. And here's the value of my efforts. And is that valuable to you? Do you see how I benefited the company? And to me, that is worth this dollar amount. So I think anything is a give and take. It's not just the individual. It's not just the company. It's is this equal success for both of us. And that's when the magic happens. Yeah. 
We're going to stop it right there for now. Please dive into the next episode of the Sales Lab to hear the conclusion of this interview. And by the way, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe and to rate this podcast on whatever app you use to listen. Also, share this with your colleagues and friends, and let's continue to have a deeper discussion on all things related to selling and sales leadership. See you next time in the Sales Lab.